So I want to tell you about three old men that I met when I was working as an exotic dancer. And as an exotic dancer, quite often I've had younger guys come into the strip club and they ask me in a very kind of hesitant manner, have you ever, you know, had to dance for like a gross old dude? And first of all, I've never had to dance for anybody. I'm an independent contractor. If I don't want to dance for somebody, I won't dance for them. And that actually has happened. There was one man, um, I actually, I really liked him, but um, I strongly suspected that he was a violent criminal, like homicidal. And um, I didn't want to be in a room alone with him. I, I thought that might be a dangerous situation to get into. And so he asked me if I wanted a VIP dance and I told him, uh, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I think that's the only time I've ever really turned anyone down for, oh no, it's not. Um, it's one of the only times I've ever really turned anybody down for a dance, but um, usually if somebody wants to dance, I'm, I was quite open to the idea because that's how I got my, my money. Um, did I dance for old dudes? Oh yeah, I danced for old dudes, but I loved dancing for older men. And it makes sense actually, if you think about it a little bit. Um, women have a, a limited, period of fertility in their lives. Like compared to the, the whole length of a woman's life, it's really a small window. And in that window, that's when a woman is really quite beautiful. So especially at the beginning of that window, when it's just kind of opened up and she's got this, this period of time where she's going to be at her most fertile, right at the beginning of that, she looks as beautiful as she is ever going to look. Most of the time, there are exceptions where a woman starts off young, but she's really overweight and then she loses a bunch of weight and gets into shape and suddenly, suddenly she looks more beautiful. As a general rule, a woman looks as beautiful as she is ever going to look in that window of time, more toward the beginning than toward the end. And I think for men, they look at it and they associate youth with beauty because of that. It's like, okay, you're young, you're at the peak of your fertility, and you're beautiful. And that's what makes, that's what makes a member of the opposite sex, for men at least, attractive. For women, it doesn't necessarily work out so much like that because men have a much wider window of fertility. Technically, a 70-year-old man can get somebody pregnant if he finds somebody who's, well, willing to be impregnated. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to be attracted to a 70-year-old man, but they have a, a much more flexible window of opportunity. And this gives them time to do things that men typically do in life. They establish themselves, they build up resources, and they, they find their place in the social hierarchy. Basically, they build up power for themselves so that when they meet a woman, they've, they've kind of already established some power. And, you know, typically when it comes to marriage, they, they continue establishing power after they've married that woman and sometimes after they've had their kids but well yeah frequently after they've had their kids really but um you know when women choose a man they're either choosing someone usually choosing someone roughly five years older than they are who's already kind of begun to establish some power on him and sort of building some momentum but an older man who's already done that who's already finished establishing power who's finished building up his resources and who's kind of reached that peak point um, is, is not going to be entirely unattractive to a woman, even if he is older. Um, I'm not saying that I'm seriously into older dudes. What I'm saying is that an older guy isn't going to be innately gross. Like they don't just have that kind of turn off element going for them quite so much as say an older woman would have for a younger man. Again, there are exceptions to all these rules, so, you know, if you're, if you're a young guy who's really, really into to na naughty grannies, um, you know, please don't, don't be offended by that. I was going to say don't leave a comment, but I mean, if you're, if you're a young dude who's into old grannies, I mean, fine, leave a comment, I don't care. Um, old men aren't going to be an automatic turnoff for women, necessarily, as a general rule. But that's not why I like dancing for older men. Back when I was a dancer and I was dancing for older men, the thing that really made me happy when I was dancing for older men is that they're very easy to talk to. An older man will have had a much longer period of time in his life 
where he has had opportunities to practice talking to women. And he'll be much more skillful at it simply because if you do something long enough, you get good at it. And younger men, you know, some younger men are just naturally very good at talking to women, but generally younger men, they're not as well practiced. They're not as smooth. They're not as good at setting a woman at ease and making her laugh and just having in a fun conversation. There's a, there's a certain degree of tension and there's a certain degree of inexperience that plays into that. And, you know, there are exceptions to that rule as well. And there are exceptions on the other side where you have older men who simply never learned how to talk to women. And it's kind of sad because it's like, dude, you've had all these years and you still haven't learned how to talk to women. I mean, I know why you're in a strip club, but that's not a good thing. Um, but there are a lot of older men who just, they're, they're very well practiced at it. Um, they know how to tell jokes to women. They know how to make women laugh. They know how to be funny and entertaining and also, you know, relaxed and at ease and how to have a good time. An older man is like, I've had, I've had older customers who have told me some of the raunchiest things, but they managed to say it in just the right way with just the right tone of voice and with just the right timing that it's actually quite hilarious. Basically they've grasped humor and they know how to tell the joke. And that's, that's a kind of a big deal. Um, I remember when I first started dancing, I was in this club and one of the guys who worked there and one of the regulars, they were, they were having a bit of a spar with each other and it was a playful thing. And they were trading insults back and forth. And I was watching them and thinking that this is a beautiful, beautiful thing because this is how men frequently display to women. You know, they don't hop up on, on horses and get out their lances and charge at each other anymore. They, they banter back and forth and they use their wits and their cleverness and you know, their, their verbal skills to, to display, you know, all sorts of things that a woman might be interested in, such as, you know, their, their mental ability, their mental um, agility. This is, this is a beautiful thing. So I remember sitting in a strip club watching these guys go back and forth and thinking that it was really amazing to be able to witness, you know, basically a male sexual display sitting in a bar, like some seedy little bar in the middle of nowhere, and you can still kind of watch this. And if you, if you really think about what you're looking at, it's amazingly beautiful. But, you know, older guys, they tend to have this down a lot better. And so when you talk to them as a woman, you know, as an exotic dancer, so in a kind of a sexualized capacity, you get to really enjoy the, the beauty of that, um, that wittiness and that display. And also it's just, it's easy to have a conversation with them. And when you sell like a half hour dance or an hour long dance to somebody, it's really helpful to be able to have a conversation with them because you're going to be stuck with that person on a couch in a tiny little room. And if you can't talk to them very well, it can be not so fun. Um, I've had guys that I've sold long dances to who were really, really drunk and they couldn't string too many words together, or they were, you know, really shy around women and they would just kind of go deer in the headlights on me. And it was like, I have to dance for this entire hour because you and I can't have a conversation. This isn't working. And it's really exhausting to dance for a whole hour. Um, and it does happen. And I remember, I mean, there have been times where I've literally had to sit and shake my butt for an entire hour because that guy and I were just not, we're, we weren't talking very well to each other. And it's boring. It's boring for you. It's it might be boring for the customer, maybe not. I had one guy who, who literally paid me to sit for a half an hour and rub the tip of my nose up against the tip of his nose, and he loved it. Um, he didn't speak very much English. Um, I think he was, I think he was Russian. Didn't speak much English. Really loved just rubbing the tip of his nose against the tip of my nose. <laughs> and I did it for a half an hour and I had to quit and not sell him another dance because my nose was getting sore. Um, but most of the time, if you want a dance to be interesting, you kind of need to have some sort of a dialogue going. Much, much easier to establish that with an older guy. Not all older guys know how to talk to women though. And I wanted to tell you stories about three different older gentlemen who really sucked at talking to women. 
So the first guy, I had just started dancing. I was a very new dancer and I was in the shitty titty bar on stage and it was a long set and there weren't that many customers and most of them were sitting over by the bar getting drunk and this guy comes up to the edge of the uh up to the edge of the stage he starts talking to me and so i sat down at the edge of the stage and i started talking to him he gave me like 20 bucks or something he was nice nice enough you know and he tells me that he has a once in a lifetime opportunity and I'm just a highly skeptical person, but I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm listening. What's your, what's your once in a lifetime opportunity that you're telling me about? You know, keep the customer happy and he'll keep giving you money. And so he tells me about this once in a lifetime opportunity. He's got a house out in the middle of the prairie. Like I lived in the middle of the prairie. He lived farther into the middle of the prairie. Um, and he wanted me to come and live with him. And I could, I could come and live in his house in the middle of the prairie, in the middle of nowhere, and cook for him and clean for him. And I would never have to work again another day in all my life. Now, doesn't that just sound like the most wonderful thing? Now, I grew up next to a wheat field. Actually, I think it was, it was just a hay field, but anyway, it was a field. I was across the street from a field. And that's what I woke up and saw every morning. Um, that was pretty much all there was at where I lived. There were lots and lots of fields. And then there was a little teeny town in the middle of all the fields. And there wasn't much outside of that. It was just fields and then more fields and then, you know, kind of sort of a hill and then more fields. Um, when I did my very brief stint in college, I actually had a professor who'd written a large paper on the early settlers who had gone completely insane because of the emptiness all around them and done things like chop up their entire family with a hatchet. Um, <laughs> people went nuts when the first colonists came to the area where I grew up because there was nothing out there but fields. And so this man is describing to me this wonderful paradise that he's going to give to me. And to me, it just sounds like a recipe for insanity. I'll be out alone in the middle of a field somewhere, separated from any friends or family or other human beings that I could talk to or form relationships with, living with this old guy who's, you know, doesn't know me from Adam and probably won't be the best of companionship, who wants me to cook and clean for him all the time. And that's all I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Live in the middle of this wheat field with this, this old dude. And so, you know, having listened to his proposition, I said, well, you know what, I think, um, I think I'm going to need some time to consider that. Um, that's a very nice offer. And um, I'm going to go think about it a little bit and I'll get back to you. And I got off stage and I thought, I don't have to talk to this guy again for the rest of the night. So I'm not going to talk to this guy again for the rest of the night. Problem solved. No problem. And so I went and talked to other customers and the night went on and Toward the end of the night, he comes up to me with this big smile on his face. And he's like, well, have you considered my, uh, my proposition? It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I was just like, oh God, you didn't take the hint, did you, man? Okay. And I was like, well, it's a very nice offer. It really is. But um, I think I'm going to have to decline. And he gets mad at me. And he's like, well, you know, if you were gonna say no, you could have, you know, told me before, we, you know, not made me wait all night long. And it's like, you know, I didn't know what to say. He was just so angry. And then he turned around, and he stormed out of the club. And it's like, I wasted an entire night. I mean, I don't know how many other girls he had lined up that he was going to make this once in a lifetime opportunity offer to, but apparently I wasted his night. <laughs> okay, whatever. A month goes by, a different old guy comes into the strip club, walks up to me. I have a once in a lifetime opportunity for you. And I'm like, oh God, you gotta be kidding. Here we go again. 
And it was basically the same opportunity, different wheat field, but same, same idea. You know, you go, you live with me in my little teeny house in the middle of the prairie, you cook for me, you clean for me, basically you work as a sex slave, sex toy slash servant slash cook, and you never have to work again another day in your life. Isn't that a wonderful offer? And so I'm smiling and being polite and listening and nodding. And at this point, I know I can't just avoid this very awkward conversation by saying, well, you know, let me consider it. And so I was like, you know, <laughs> and I'm getting the same line too. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Forget the fact that it happened last month. Um, and so I look at it and I say, eh, you know, this is a very nice offer, but I think, I think I'm going to have to decline. And he gets mad at me. Well, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> well, I'm not living in a wheat field taking care of some old guy. I'm not doing that. So, you know, at least I did something. Um, and he gets angry and he storms out. Luckily, those were the only two once in a lifetime opportunities that happened that year. But, um, you know, fast forward a little bit, years down the road, I'm I'm living with my husband. I don't know if we had actually gotten married at that point or if we were like, we were th within a few months of getting married. So we had either not gotten married yet at that point or we had just gotten married and we were in the same apartment. So it's kind of hard for me to remember exactly when. But I was at the strip club and I was working and it, it took my husband years to get me to quit dancing. Like that was something that I kept doing, kept doing for quite a while. It was kind of my, my security blanket, but I was at the strip club and he had come home for the evening and I think he was like making supper or something cause he had his job and it was more of a day job. Mine was more of a night job, what have you. Um, there was this table with this old guy at it. And so I went up to the table and the old guy, you know, I asked him if he wanted to dance and he's like, come sit with me for a little while. It's like, mm, okay. So I sat down with him. It was a slow night again. There have been many slow nights in that industry, <laughs> which leads to many interesting stories. He starts telling me about this wonderful offer that he has for me. And I, I'm thinking, okay, here we go again. And he tells me that I will never have to work again a day in my life. I can go and do whatever I want. I can party, I can have fun. I can have a good old time and he will pay all my bills. He will pay all my rent. He'll pay everything for me. And I will never have to worry about money again, as long as I live. And I'm listening and I'm trying to keep a straight face. So I've got that polite, attentive look and I'm trying to do the polite, attentive smile, which occasionally is creaking upward a little bit on my cheeks too to become this, like, I'm gonna laugh in your face any minute and I have to not do that because I'm at work and I'm a professional, God damn it. So he's telling me about this wonderful opportunity and I'm nodding along. There are only three rules that you have to follow. I'm like, okay, here come the rules. <laughs> and he's like, I can't remember the first rule. It was pretty inconsequential. It was very basic. You know, you have to cook me meals. You have to clean for me, something like that. I can't remember. Um, number two, rule number two, your pussy belongs to me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that means that if I'm having a jacuzzi party with a bunch of my friends and I want you there, I can call you up. And even if you're here at the club, you drop what you're doing. You come over here to hang out in the jacuzzi with me and my friends. I'm like, all right. Yeah, I'm totally going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to give up my nice life that I'm living to go, you know, be your servant, whatever. And I'm just smiling and nodding. <laughs> and then he gets to rule number three, which is truly one of the most wonderful things that anyone has ever said to me in the strip club. He's like rule number three, and this is important. I'm like, okay, you have to call me big daddy. I have to call you what? <laughs> so there I am sitting at a table with Big Daddy and um, trying very, very hard not to laugh because, you know, because I'm a professional, goddammit, I'm not gonna laugh in this man's face. And so, you know, I kind of have that creepy smile kind of going on where it's like, mm. um, 
excuse me, I, I have to go powder my nose. I'll be right back. And I get up and I go to the ladies room and as I'm walking into the ladies room, the changing room inside the ladies room, I start just laughing as hard as I can, like doubled over laughing. And there's some dancers in the changing room. And like, it was, it was this area next to the stage where, you know, customers weren't allowed to go. <laughs> and some of the, the other dancers in there were like, what's going on? I was like, you would not believe the conversation I just had. And so, you know, I laughed a bit and when I finally kind of got got done and calmed down and I could walk around without just bursting out laughing at random intervals, I went back outside and started working again. Um, when I got home, I closed the door behind me and my husband was in the kitchen and I looked at him and I was like, you would not believe the conversation I just had. <laughs> And even to this day, Big Daddy lives on in our memory. Thank you, Big Daddy, wherever you are. I will never stop laughing at your expense. <laughs> I seriously, I, I honestly do not think he was trying to pull a prank on me. Like sometimes you have to wonder if maybe the guy is pulling a prank on you because guys pull pranks on strippers, right? I think he was serious. God. <laughs> so yeah, that is why, that is, that is one of the reasons why old dudes are awesome because frequently they're excellent conversationalists and even when they aren't good at conversations, sometimes the awkward shit you experience in a strip club is very worth it. I'll talk to you guys later.